This is Season 3, Episode 4 of Mastering the RPG, a tabletop RPG podcast all about upping your game. Doesn't matter if you're a game master or player, you'll find advice, ideas, and some strong opinions. Tonight's episode is actually casual conversation. What random things are on our bookshelf? This is Carl again with Mastering the RPG, a tabletop RPG podcast, just like I said. Um, And we're all about advice, ideas, cool stuff bound, and all sorts of good stuff. You can find us at MasteringTheRPG.com or Game Master, or you can email at Game Master at MasteringTheRPG.com. Again, that's Game Master at MasteringTheRPG.com. I'm Carl with my co-hosts, Eric and James. So we're, I'm happy to be here. This is going to be a fun conversation. So let's, let's see what's been going on. James, I know you are in the thick of things already now with your, with your games that have started. So how's that going? Yeah, very much, very much. So I, I'm running seven games this week, seven days a week, which is kind of a bit exciting. Um, and we're winding up campaigns. So I've got my, um, my four school age campaigns that are all coming to the end in the next six weeks. So... It's about preparing for that large like boss battle fight at the end, making sure I'm tying up all the loose threads for people's uh, backstories and subplots, um, allowing for some time for reflection for the player's journey before I smash them with probably a double session uh, boss <laughs> fight, which I'm looking very much forward to, which is really, really great. Um, after a little hiatus, I'm back into my Call of Cthulhu Masks of Nyarlathotep campaign on Sunday, which uh, we're into year three on that baby, so... Uh, that's certainly doing very, very well. About to tie up the Egyptian chapter of Masters of Nyarlathotep. And on Friday night, I get to play a new RPG, which I've never run before or never played before. I'm playing in Die, the uh, RPG for Die, which is based on a series of comics and graphic novels, which I'm really excited to do. So a massive week of uh, role-playing games. Um, can't wait for any of it. Uh, OMG is all I can say. So, I mean... <laughs> We we literally uh, we're doing our one campaign right now uh, with Eric and the team, and we just now had their first. They had a they had a couple of uh, sessions, and this is really the first heavy heavy combat session that they had against something against some undead. Um, they had killed some cats before, or some wild cats, or uh, before, but this was the first time they've really encountered anything um, that could cause some major damage but uh they didn't get major damage at all they were able to get by without without anything so campaign starting spinning up um really they've gotten a couple advances this is savage worlds and so we'll just keep keep moving forward on that one eric you got anything going on on and we're finally we're finally playing with savage pathfinder too which is something that we've gone over a lot yeah Um, but then me and you like together like i've played it a little bit before and we've talked about it a lot but me and you have never actually played a full campaign so now we're actually getting into it and we have the apg involved which is the advanced players guide um you know a lot of different classes going around so it's it's definitely interesting to get into that because it's such a different take on savage worlds and the way that like with the class art the class um Class edges. Uh, the class edges, yeah, yeah, which are kind of like R-types. But, yeah, so it's been interesting for sure. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a unique um, play. I mean, all of our Savage Worlds we've done so far has been core book. Um, you know, and with plus, some, though. I mean, plus or, some additional yeah. stuff here and there. But this is really the first we're really diving into Savage Pathfinder as an entity. Because um, it's, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's something in and of itself, you know, complete. Um, which I'm, I'm kind of enjoying. I uh, haven't done fantasy in a long time, so I'm kind of enjoying trying to come up with some, some interesting stuff in the fantasy genre um, in this world that I'm creating. So, yeah, very cool. Nothing like James, though. Oh my God, um, I, I don't, I don't know <laughs> no, how you no, would. No. I don't know how I could handle it, that much work. So, um, so yeah. Just uh, don't, so- just don't think about it and play what's in front of you. Is what I do. It's like <laughs> I'm not even thinking about tomorrow's session. I'm thinking about. While beyond the witch light in four and a half hours. That's it. That's singular focus. <laughs> How much do you ever do? You ever have? You must have like a lot of dreams, or at this point, like you just don't have any more dreams of like you being in a fantasy world. Yeah, that, like no, that. no, no, no. All, all my dreams are horrible terrors now. They're terror-filled oh, nightmares okay. of, a, of a mishmash of all of them jumbled together, of which I'm yeah. normally naked. So you know, I try not to dream <laughs> if I can. 
Like, it's either that or you're just you eating a sandwich or something. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Doing a quiet crossword and, uh, yeah, but having a cup of tea <laughs> is my drink. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it's been pretty slow for me, Carl. Besides your game, the other games that I've been involved in are pretty slow. Um, I've actually been playing Cyberpunk, the new expansion recently, and it really, really got me motivated. Because I, when I played Cyberpunk Red, or I think that's what it's called, the new, like, you know, tabletop RPG Cyberpunk, I... Well, you know, I love the world, and there's some of the systems I liked. I, I really just hated it. You know, I think I've talked about it before. I, I mean, I've talked about it with you guys before. I don't know if I've talked about it on the podcast before, but um, it's one of the worst rulebook, like, designs. Like, the, the formatting is the, the worst rulebook I've ever seen, and there's a lot of systems that annoy me. And so I'm definitely getting inspired now to do a Savage Worlds take on it, kind of how I did my Savage Fallout book. Um, because I do really enjoy doing conversions, so I've been, I've been now. That's what I'm getting into the weeds of with myself. The thing is, something that I want to pursue, um, because I got a lot of good feedback from my Savage Fallout. So I definitely have some ideas. And, and obviously, the hardest thing I think maybe I'll bounce ideas off of Carl too is is the hacking systems, and that's something that we've always felt that nobody's ever really gotten right as far as hacking. Yeah, um, it's either like too involved or not involved enough. Um, the cool thing about Cyberpunk the game is there's something called quick hacking, which uh, you know. It's, to bring over to Savage Worlds would, would just more obviously be like a, a take on the powers, power systems. Um, and then the kind of more in-depth hacking of like actually getting to networks. That's the part that all the cyberpunk things we've ever seen, which we've, you know, we played um, Interface Zero, which is a Savage Worlds setting. And then we've also reviewed, um, like there was a Shadow Run Savage Worlds and we've seen some other cyberpunk stuff. And for Sprawl, us, the hacking was just always kind of a miss, you know? It's yeah, called Sprawl Runner for those again, who are looking it's it either. Yeah, it's either, like, I feel like it's always either too much, because nobody, you know, not even just Savage Worlds, all of, since this is casual conversations, I'm just going to talk about this for a second, uh, all of the, you know, I feel like, you know, Cyberpunk, whether it is, or well, I'm, I'm sure, James, you've played the, some of these games, too, where there's, like, hacking. It's like 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 Shadowrun, right? Shadowrun. Like That's it, the big to one me, I'll a play. failure is a failure is if you have to then spend, okay, switch over to some other person and always be spending, like, 10 minutes with them. And there's like other thing, like to me that just never really works and flows right. And it's just always interruptive and not good game flow. So I'm just against the whole thing of like hacking being like, it's such an in-depth system that takes so long. Um, but I also don't like it just being a, like a single role all the time. So I think there's a good middle ground there. Uh, sounds like a yeah, good. Anyways, that's, that's, the, that's the only thing I've been going yeah, over. <laughs> sounds like a good opportunity for a modified dramatic task um, of some shape exactly. or form. Exactly. Yeah. And that's, that's what I've been toying with. Something that we've talked about before too. Yeah. So cool. Well, that's good. I mean, you know, it's nothing like having the creative flow juices flowing and, and, you know, even if it's just in your mind, <laughs> mind's eye that you're coming up with something, it's, it's kind of fun to do that. Just, you know, think and create. It's, it's awesome. Good to hear. Um, so, this is casual conversation, and so we were talking about what we wanted to do for season three, and one of the things came out is like, you know, we're always advice, advice, advice. Let's just kind of rap about something in the topic of let's turn around and look at our bookshelf, and if anyone's watched Tabletop Tango YouTube channel, you know that my bookshelf is right behind <laughs> me, on the, and it's got all my stuff on it. Um, so it was like, hey, it would be cool to see, let's talk the physical world. What kind of cool stuff do you have on your shelf physically? And then what's in your virtual bookshelf? Because a lot of people have have PDFs now. And what's, you know, for me, it's like kind of the old stuff, highlights, new stuff, miscellaneous, weird stuff um, that I happen to have and, uh, um, you know, go through some of that. So that's what we want to do. I don't know who wants to, who wants to kick it off. I'm more than happy to do so if if you want. I'm I'm looking at your virtual bookshelf. When I say virtual bookshelf, I'm I'm looking at you virtually, um, <laughs> and I can see your bookshelf. So why don't you start us off, Carl? You've got an immense library behind you, uh, and I'm sure there's some crazy throwbacks to yesteryear that you might have dug out of that. What's the weirdest thing you could find from a, a quick look behind you? Uh, the well, so there's two. I would say kind of. Things that people might not have. I mean, my weirdest thing is I literally have 16 Dragonlance books. That's probably the weirdest thing. But things that other people may not have um, that often is... The first is I have a CD-ROM, which I've copied off, of the Dragon Magazine archive. The first 250-ish nice. epi or episodes. Two, 250 issues were in this CD-ROM that they produced years and years ago. And so it's, it's really cool... Now, I don't even have a CD-ROM on my computer anymore. Fortunately, I, that was my fortunately one I pulled <laughs> all of that off like before CD-ROMs oh, went okay. away. Um, so I have all the PDFs on my computer, but I still keep the, the box on my 
on my shelf. And so it's like nice to reminisce sometimes and just look back at and say, you know, there was so much good material in that old, those old Dragon magazines. It's just fun to go back and look. And, and it's got all the art for, for every magazine. Yeah. And some of the art was just absolutely fantastic and it was just very exciting to look at. So it's on my bookshelf, but it's more kind of that mix between virtual and real. And then the second one that I'll, I'll That's, bring up. I'm, I'm going to stop you there for a second, Carl. That's hilarious because I've got an old Lever Arch folder where as a 14 year old, I photocopied Dragon, uh, the whole Dragon articles out of my Dragon magazine so I could reference them quicker. So I, I still have my old kind of 30 year old folder now sitting in my shed oh. of all the Dragon articles that I loved as a child. So um, well, amazing yeah. that they're still, they're still around somewhere. Sorry, in I'll store- continue. Well, no, in storage I have from episode or episode, I keep saying that from issue sixty seven all the way up to the last issue they made, I think was three hundred wow. or something like that. That's in storage, and then I used to get Dungeon Magazine too, which was uh, another. I don't know if Paizo owned it at the time, but it was another magazine that had just adventures in it, and so it, it yeah. kind of was a partner publication. I have a ton of those in storage too. Um, too bad I don't have those in PDF, because that would be great to have in PDF. I am not going to go to storage and start rummaging through Dungeon Magazines looking for, for they adventures. They must have them somewhere, though, to, like, right? Somebody must have uploaded them. Uploaded them oh, all. I'm sure. I'm sure probably somewhere they exist. Yeah. Um, I haven't gone looking for them, but I, I, I bet you you can get them, PDF uh, copies of them somewhere for sure. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm, I was very excited when I got that CD-ROM many, many, many years ago at Gen Con back when... Back when they still were there selling stuff, um, the TSR Watsi people. So, um, yeah, it was very exciting, very exciting. Um, and then I'll, I'll before I turn it over, I'll I've got lots of stuff to talk about. But I'll also talk about I have the Silver Anniversary D and D box set that TSR put out Ooh, for the Silver Anniversary yes. of the game. And this I has remember. reprints. Yeah. This has reprints of a lot of different modules. It's got a reprint of the original cover um, uh, uh, box set, first edition, or first edition, um, the first box set, the BX stuff. And it's got B2 in it, the Keep on the Borderlands. It's got a history. It's got Ravenloft in it, the the, um, Giant series. It's got... um, White Plume Mountain in it. It's, it's yeah. So it had a whole bunch of Classics. reprints of a lot of stuff. And so I don't know how many people have that on their shelf, but um, and that's the 25th anniversary. What are we up to now as far as anniversary goes? I mean, it's like I lose track. It's like, what is it, 40 years now, 45 years of the game? Yeah, well, almost 50, yep. Yeah, almost 50. So It's crazy. Uh, so that's where I'll start, the two, cra- <laughs> the two ones that really, like, stick out in my mind but i got others but i i, I don't want to i don't want to uh take over the just what i'm reminiscing on my bookshelf so i don't know james what about what what did you have that first hit you when you're looking at your shelf saying this is the coolest thing that i have to i have to tell people well i would say well i'll, I'll talk about coolest things in a little bit obscure things i've i've got a few things that i i kind of keep in my collection and it's a little bit different because i'm australian right so uh, every now and then, a role-playing game will put to get will put out a, a supplement or a, a little bit that is an Australian source book. And one of the one of my favourite uh, of those from yesteryear is the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles role-playing game Mutants Down Under uh, source book for running Australian animals in the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles world, uh, which was so. If you ever wanted to be a you know, a mutant wombat or a, a mutant kangaroo with a joey in your pouch with an Uzi, then there's rules for all of these things. So really obscure <laughs> stuff, which I, I love. Um, and I doubt many people would have that because why on earth would you buy it unless you were mad like we were? Um, in a lot of instances, thankfully, a lot of these were written by Australian authors. So it might have just been, you know, one Australian guy getting in contact with an RPG provider and saying, hey, look, I've got this... Uh, I've got this idea, would you like to do it? But Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Mutants Down Under. The other source book I've had that's just undergone a reprint, which was actually a much better product, was Terra Australis, the um, the Call of Cthulhu source book for Australia. The original one wasn't, I don't believe it was written by an Australian, so it, uh, it has quite a few inaccuracies, 
Um, and uh, uh, but the second one that was reprinted about five years ago has been uh, has been updated, which is really really great. And the third one is the Australian source book for the Werewolf the Apocalypse role playing game. Oh wow! Um, which oh. I'm, I'm going to say was wildly inaccurate uh, in terms of Australian history and and very very kind of in some ways almost laughable. Um, but yes, where they created a, a new werewolf tribe. Uh, only for Australian, uh, based on the Tasmanian tiger, which is an extinct marsupial that went extinct in the 30s, um, and a whole kind of societal structure around uh, around werewolves in Australia. So I've got some obscure Australian stuff, and I'm constantly on the lookout for uh, more and more source books that that tends to get Australian culture and Australian geography terribly wrong. So, so the Call of, both so awesome the call of Cthulhu stuff... The Call of Cthulhu stuff, they really didn't have to do much as far as all the enemies that are just going to kill you, because that's Australia, yeah, right? Yeah, I mean, that's, everything's going to kill you, yeah, so they yeah, just have right. to stat up normal stuff. Just so. put a bunch of animals together, yeah, just shove them together, and they're horrible monsters. Yeah, the, uh, that's right. The, the, the monster book is, is large, but it only has two fictitious um, uh, entries in it. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's very good. And, and, and it's interesting when, when, you, when you look at Australian content, um, Particularly when it comes to First Nations interpretations, um, it's it's often a very fraught uh, fraught territory when you're trying to um, yeah. represent other cultures. And I've got to say that some do it well and some do it absolutely terribly. So uh, keep an eye out for if you find. Please let me know if you find a, a random source book for a, a game based on Australia. Please shoot us an email. I'll, I'll try and track it down. That, that's a lot of my obscure things. Very, that's cool. <laughs> Um, Eric, what, uh, do you got anything obscure in your virtual vault? Well, I mean, we uh, can talk about virtual stuff. Well, uh, I mean, on, on my actual bookshelf, as far as tabletop, you know, because I, I came to tabletop gaming much later in my life compared to you two. Um, and at that point, you know, uh, PDFs were, were still was just around. So it wasn't, you know, I have like D&D and Pathfinder books. I would say the only sort of obscure thing on my actual bookshelf um, was this game that I loved that was very much under the radar. It was made by a Spanish company called Faith. It's called Faith. Yeah. And it's actually like a very, almost like hard sci-fi game. Um, and it started out, it wasn't even a book. Um, you, you, you had cards, like cards were the whole thing, like either playing card decks that had different art on them and different symbols, and then like cards for the monsters and for items and stuff like that. And they didn't even have a character sheet. I actually made the first character sheet on, with their blessing, and that was used, and they actually modeled their character sheet based on my character sheet. And then I actually ended up making um, some of the stuff for the game, like, like, like character options. Um, but I have their core book, and I have like a lot of the old cards from them. It was just really, really cool game, and I would love to play it more, but there's not really any VTT assets actualized. But it's, like, it's funny because it's called Faith because they, while it's kind of hard sci-fi, there is like space magic based on these enigmatic gods that are, there's basically these like kind of five archetypal gods that are kind of like, you know, those are like the main entities that like ever, all the different like people from across the galaxy use as their, their, their gods that they base on them. And they give like powers. And then there's also stuff like cybernetics and things like that. So it's a really, really interesting settings where humans are like basically the, um, <laughs> they're like they're like the bottom of the rung, you know. If you want to play as human, you're like the bottom of the rung as one of the main races. So a really really cool setting that um, I don't I've never met anybody else who's ever heard of it even. Um, so yeah, <laughs> is it in Spanish? No, it's not. It's it's okay. in America. It, it's in English. It's in American. He says. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Well, <laughs> well, I, well American yeah, yeah. English Why is that? different than other uh, English. That's for sure. You know, it is true. You bet it is. I mean, I think I think there was some. I think it was mostly popular here, but um, yeah, just a really cool. Um, they even made then they made like a board game based on like the, the like sport, like which is like a grav ball sport. Um, the art is like, gra it's one of the best art I've ever seen, hands down. Drop dead gorgeous. Um, if I know I, if we were posting some stuff, Carl, maybe I'll send you some of the art because it truly is some of the best art I've ever seen. Um, so just that's like totally random, totally in very inspired game that. Like I said, it's completely under the radar, but like very high production values. Um, that's yeah. that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. I I have I have this is one that's obscure, that I I don't know. I, there's probably 50 people in the whole world who has this have this because the way it was made. Um, so are you guys familiar at all with Starfleet Battles? It's a uh, was a tactical yes. tactical game. Yep. 
um, by the yeah. Armarillo Design Bureau. And we used to play it when I was younger. We played it all the time. You know, basically had the two six-foot tables side by side with the one-inch hex grid. And we, were going, we would do battles back and forth with the Starfleet <laughs> action. And we loved it. Well, one day at Gen Con, somebody said, hey, and, this, and all these things were like um, loose leaf. And you basically built the book yourself in a D-ring binder, and so you had your book is this binder. Somebody said to the, own, uh, the, the developer, you should do a book. And he said, okay, well, if you guys give me 50 bucks, I'll, I'll go get a book printed. And uh, like I think about 50 people gave him 50 bucks at Gen Con. He went and he got a book, and so I have an actual hardbound of those rule book of the rules, which normally were just loose leaf paper. So I, literally, that's one that's a that I don't think anyone else, in the, very few people in the world. Now, it's not a great printing because, you know, um, back in those days, we weren't doing everything with uh, layout software. So, you know, there's a lot of photocopying going on, I'm assuming. Um, but I, that's something I have that uh, I don't think a lot of people have uh, on the shelf. Um, I also found my 2004 copy of Savage Worlds. Now that we're like, I'm like a Savage oh, Worlds wow. aficionado, I... Literally bought that game in 2004, and I didn't play it until 2016. I, I didn't even realize I had that <laughs> until I was doing, uh, like, one of the Tabletop Tango, like, anniversary episodes. I found it, and so I used it as part of the quiz, but um, didn't even oh, know yeah. I had it until, until I found it, you know, moving stuff around. I go, holy smokes, I can't believe I had this game from way back when. Um, so, yeah, this lots of cool... And, and then I got all sorts of D20 stuff. You know, remember when OGL came out in the D20 days, there's just like, there was D20 Modern, D20 Spycraft. I even have another weird thing, Munchkin the game, you know, the, the <laughs> card game. There's a Munchkin role-playing <laughs> game that I bought from Steve Jackson Games back when D20, all the OGL stuff was coming out. I've never played it. Let's be honest. It's, it's a joke thing, right? So it, just yeah. reading the book is for fun and excitement. So um, very very thin books not a lot there but we had to buy it we had we had to buy it and i i, I think somewhere i even have um uh, a few other weird like Hackmaster. i think was somewhat based on d20 as well back in the day it might have been their own system but it was part of that tidal wave of d20 alternative games that that popped up around when was that i, I can't i'm trying to remember when did the ogl come out um with with the big brouhaha that happened recently, I would think that I'd have that year in my mind. But um, it's like two thousand, right, or something. Or yeah, I think it? you're right. It was like two thousand somewhere like that. in that. Yeah, yeah two thousand one, two thousand something like that. Yeah. So yeah, um, where ev everything came out with a D twenty and a collectible card game. You know that it, I remember <laughs> Mutant Chronicles had their RPG and their collectible card game come out all at the same time. It was a flooded market for a while, wasn't it? Oh yeah, I didn't, uh, my uh, my ex-wife at the time was really into card games, and she bought like every year. It was like, oh, this one's going to get big, and there was like one on dragons. One I was like, and then the next year they stopped publishing the cards, so you kind of had your deck, and they're all collectible, right? So they were never quite fully actualized because they had assumed they were going to publish a bunch of sets along with it. But uh, anyway, I don't have any of those on my. I'm not a card game player, so I have no card games on my on my shelf. <laughs> so. Um, so what? So what else do you do? So what other little things do you guys have laying around? Um, what? What's your new stuff? Got, what's the new I've, stuff on your shelf? Yeah, I've got, I've got some new stuff. I recently went to PAX Australia, and for the first time in about five years, I didn't run a game, which was kind of fun. Uh, but I managed to um, stop by a great little publisher called Ghostfire Gaming, and they've got offices here in Australia, but they've produced. A wonderful series of books for a setting for 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons called Grim Hollow which yes it's it's been designed for 5th edition but there there's both a campaign guide and a monster guide for this set of books that um, could very well be system ag agnostic the campaign guide in particular um, dark fantasy kind of fantasy horror kind of genre um, and I've just been going through those. I've only had them for the last couple of weeks. But with them, they, they as part of the pack for Grim Hollow, they gave me all these kind of really bizarre jars um, that you can put on your shelf with all sorts of weird, macabre 
creatures, almost like I'm from a, a bad alchemy or archaeology department. So I've got a I've got a witch's poppet and an eyeball on a stick and a whole heap of bizarre talismans. So um, when when I got my set of Grim Hollow, they sent out a whole heap of these kind of really weird looking figurines, which I've, I'm really loving kind of adding to my bookshelf to make it look even more macabre right, and, and gross and to, to, to gross my children out. And, and so these are about two inches tall. They're like little, uh, they're like little bubble things that sit over the top of a figurine in it. Yeah, they're like little medicine, um, like uh, medicinal specimens Curios. or zoo zoology yeah. kind of curios. So that, yeah, that, that's been a fun little addition to my to my collection. In terms of other things that I've managed to pick up in the last little bit, um, I found I'm a, a mad collector of monster compendiums and monster books. And in terms of digital stuff, I've, I've found a couple of fantastic Patreons that I've just started um, supporting recently. And a, a guy runs a Patreon called Corn Flux Creatures that has done some amazing monster stat box against for, again for 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons um, and he releases a monthly kind of guide of new monsters and what I'm loving about his work is they're really complex not complicated as in difficult but multi-layered monster stat blocks so there's extra stuff in them apart from just you know my monster hits you with a sword there's there's lots of bonus actions and extra actions and kind of cool stuff that you can kind of do with these quite well designed intricate um, monster design so I'm really digging him and I found a fantastic I don't know what it was something must have happened around 2020 2021 I, I'm not sure whether people were stuck in their homes for a period of time but they seem to have produced <laughs> a whole raft of amazing material since then you, the amount of stuff I've got that's got copyright 2020 is quite extraordinary um, and I found a fantastic book called the book of beautiful horrors which is kind of horrific fey like weird you just want to gross out your players again another book for fifth edition uh, dungeons and dragons and a company called quill and cauldron have done a series of uh, they call them allrons guide to the plains which is kind of an extra planar series of books and the one i'm delving right into at the moment and i just received a copy is the is their guide to the shadow fell which is like a dark, macabre world. Um, unlike the other two, which are very much 5th edition, here's your stat blocks. This one's got some really great material that you could use for any kind of upside-down world, mirror realm, dark, shadowy kind of other plane. Um, some huge... It's 400-odd pages of just pure imagination, and I'm really digging that at the moment. So they're, that, they're the three top... When I had to pick some things off my virtual shelf, these were three that just came straight at me, and it was like these are cool, weird, horrific, macabre, unusual kind of settings and monsters for any role playing game. Really, they've, they've, but they've all been amazing. That's that's cool. I, I'm fascinated by the dark, um, otherworldly. You'll you'll have to send me a note on the full name, and we'll I'll I'll take a look at that. All the people listening, I don't care about. I, I'm just I want the name myself so I can get it. <laughs> so it's the All Rounds U L R A U N T S Guides to the Plains, and they've done one for a lot of the Hells, and 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 they've they've done one for the Shadowfell. So yeah, really good books. Check them out. Very cool. Very cool. Um, now, see, I, I have a question. I have a question for you guys. This is like sure. a hypothetical. Um, so, like, wh whatever, you know, you have to escape your guys' house, and you can only fit, like, three of books into a backpack. And you're going to go to, like, a, you know, everything is being destroyed. This is what you're going to have for the, the, rest, for the rest of your life. Civilization is falling, right? What are the three books that you grab and put in your backpack? I'll start with Carl. What, do you, what would you grab? The civilization. You you're saying civilization <laughs> is, is Civilization's failing. collapsing. All the books, there's going to be no computers. You can have three books. That's it. Straight up. Three books before you go into the shelter and have to live out your days. Uh, what are the books that you're grabbing? <laughs> that's a, that's an interesting question. Does, does, it, ha does it have to <laughs> be... Switch on the spot. Does it, well, I mean, I'm just the question... Because if you say, well, it's got to include rule books, right? Then it's... Then it's probably like... It can be whatever you want. It's, th yeah, three, three game books. I mean, you know... Probably. probably well, uh, I'll go first then. Oh, yeah, yeah, you got it. Um, okay. I, I, 
<laughs> I grabbed the second edition Dungeons and Dragons Players Handbook. Okay. Bang, straight gone. <laughs> I get the Keeper's Guide for Call of Cthulhu, so I can keep running Call nice. of Cthulhu. And then some kind of guide on how to carve dice out of bone. <laughs> <laughs> Now I think that's got me covered. Yeah, yeah. The, the Bone Whittler's uh, Guide. <laughs> the, bo- the Bone Whittler's Guide to Polyhedral <laughs> Dice is what I picked as my third option. The, the, the Survival Guide, How to Play Tabletop RPG Games in the Apocalypse. That's the, that's I, the book that you I, I must admit, I, I have played a lot of role-playing games camping. You know, we go out and, and, yeah. and so you've got nothing. You've got a, a little gas lantern and a, and a card table and, and lots of people sitting around a fire and that's about it. And I, I've done lots of that stuff. So you just need dice and a player's handbook and you generally make it up as you go along. And it, yeah. it's, some, it's some of the best role playing, really. When you strip back all the guides and all the extra books and you're just sure. using core rules, you can come up with some really great stuff. So Which I is perfect for playing in a bunker. <laughs> well, so so if if it's if it's to be able to play, honestly, I think I would probably grab I mean, it's my. Just, it's just your ins. Yeah, go on. Sorry, I probably would dra- grab my first edition stuff because I've got enough okay. of that. That um, and it's simple enough that Civilization Falls. Everybody can understand it. So I mean, I'm, I'm looking at my bookshelf and you. I've got the first. I've got the the player's handbook. DMG and Monster Manual for every edition, like sitting on my bookshelf next to each other. Yeah. So you can literally, whatever edition you kind of pull at the time, it's like, oh, I don't know, uh, grab forth because it's they're sitting there in a box set. And then everybody's going to get mad at you when you're on a desert island and say, we never <laughs> liked fourth edition. <laughs> fourth edition's too, yeah, too yeah. like World of Warcraft and all the games are, all the computers are gone. So you're reminding me of the good the good old days. So anyway, but... The good uh, times. Yeah. yeah, the good times. So. Well, here's for, another one. Here, fourth here, edition? Here, here, no thanks, I'll take the apocalypse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Hey, you know it's funny though now because with the rise of two E, and I think I think more people are actually opening up to fourth edition as, especially with some of the new game systems that have been coming out. People are like liking that more kind of gamist um, approach, and I think forty is actually beginning in popularity recently, um, which is very interesting. But but besides that, now here's another one that uh, say a sadistic person comes in and you can only have you save one book. This is not the apocalypse. You can still play games normally, but like what's your most? They're going to set fire to your collection. You can save one book. What would it be? Like what's your most like treasured possession? So yeah. Hmm. Uh, for me, it would actually be. I, I know I've mentioned it. I'm running this game. It would be the Masks of Nyarlathotep box set. Um, okay. It's a massive, over a thousand pages of module, but importantly, it's got a beautiful set of handouts in it. Like it's actually nice. quite gorgeous. Yeah. So it, it's in terms of both a functional game, beautifully written, but a gorgeous piece of art. Um, I would grab that, and it, yeah. again. It's probably hefty enough to beat off a, a psychopath with <laughs> if you needed to defend yourself. Uh, it, it's certainly a chaos stop god. a bullet. It would certainly stop a bullet. So you yeah, know, okay, you okay. Use that. <laughs> I, I noticed Carl's looking very forlornly at his shorts. Right yeah, now he, it's like this is a nightmare scenario for Carl. Oh my god! <laughs> I mean, how how do you choose between your babies? <laughs> you can only choose one baby. I, I don't. Choice, I don't know yeah. if uh, you know. Honestly, nothing. Let's be honest. Nothing that I have on my shelf is like a collectible most important thing that you know historically it's the first you know the first printing of something that i had the first copy of and therefore yeah i'd have to say you know none of, none of that stuff is is like that and i even have collectible like leather bound books that i got from gen con and stuff like that but none of it's that important you know i mean i i don't know um Okay, well, yeah. Carl, but if you only choose one, like that, <laughs> if the Chaos God is going to destroy your whole collection. You can only save one. I mean, what, what, which one of those first edition or whatever would you just keep? You know, can't you just can't choose one? Uh, um, well, I guess I guess I would grab the Starfleet Battles Hardbound because there's there you go. It's ir- so it's kind of and, unreplaceable um, yeah. as far as yeah. as far as and that important goes. to you, right? Like when you got it and uh, that part of your life, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, I think I would have to have to cool. go there. So, and then we yeah, have to I, whittle I, for miniatures. Me it's just, <laughs> <laughs> for me, I just don't have anything that's really that valuable. I mean, I guess, like I said, the Faith book is kind of like that is just out of print now. So th- probably that's the one that I would save. Um, and then for the Desert Island, I mean, we we got the we, we you know the uh, Peg was nice enough to give us like a bunch of free crap, 
and or free stuff, I should say, not crap. But they gave <laughs> us the Pathfinder, the Savage Worlds Pathfinder box set, and with that, I could just you know that that could be I could use, do so many games with that. So that's probably what I would take for the. So that's good. If we're on everything's if, in there. If we were on a desert yeah. island, you could bring that, and then I, I can that, I can bring a different first... for some other Savage World book, and before you know it, we've we've recreated civilization and Savage Worlds image. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Oh dear. <laughs> it, well, it's better than recreating it in Call of Cthulhu's image. So exactly. I think you're exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> are already dealing with the wastelands we don't need to have big scary monsters in it, so. yeah, yeah. yeah. See, now, exactly. if this was about board games i'd have a much harder uh choices to make because i have like what a hundred and i've been you know i've constantly gotten rid of games but yeah i have like a hundred board games or something in a humongous cabinet in my living room so that'd be a much harder pill well you must have well. one that's that's um limited edition from a kickstarter or something yeah, and there's only have, so many I have of them a lot made. of those I mean, yeah, I mean, I have one of the early editions of, it was a Settlers of Catan, so the, the Starfarers of Catan, and I think they've reprinted it now, but I have one of the first ones, which was this really cool, um, I don't know if you've ever played Starfarers of Catan, but um, they made this, like, sci-fi version where you had this, basically you have this, like, uh, the one that I, it's like a retro 50s rocket ship that acts as the dice and also acts as, like, an, um, you, you can when you when you upgrade your ships you like put little plastic pieces on it and you also like shake it and there's little colored cubes inside of it it's just like really cool but like novel thing and I have one of the first editions of that that um, I, I don't think you can find those anymore that's very um, cool. even the reprinted ones aren't the same so yeah and that's that's a great game it's my it's actually my favorite version of Catan um, which I don't play I also have a very early version of, of Samurai which was a I think mm. I think it's Reiner Knizia, um which is this really really cool Basically, yeah, is it Reiner? Yeah, it's Reiner Knizia, uh, which is this really cool kind of, um, it's, it's basically an abstract, uh, abstract strategy game, but like, uh, it's, 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 a, it's this beautiful board of Japan, and you have these really cool little like minis with it, um, you know, th these Euro style games that are just very like tactile. Um, I just have so many, but <laughs> yeah, th those are just ones that are because I got them like, I got like first printings of them, which were, which were, was really cool. That, that is. I guess that's the most interesting stuff is the things that are early. Like I, when I was looking at my yeah my shelf, it's like boy, it's kind of boy. Like I got one of all the early TSR products except for Boot Hill, and it's like wow, that just am I ever going to play that? No, I mean I won't. I mm. I love Top Secret yeah. in the day, but am I ever going to play Top Secret again? No, probably not. But it's just kind of fun to. It's kind of creates that memories of when you're playing Star Frontiers and Top Secret and Gamma World and all that kind of stuff back in the day. Uh, so it's, it's kind of, kind of a, now my bookshelf is getting overrun by Savage World stuff, which is starting to take. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> Just like the Pathfinder the box yeah. set, the Essentials, Holler, yeah. all the, you know, I buy hard, I like hardbound, so I have like Fantasy Companion and Superpowers Companion and stuff like that all in hardbound. Me too, yeah. Yeah, so I, 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 I still like the hardbounds. And There's one more game I wanted to bring. Oh, sorry, go on. Even if you uh, even if you just play your one system fifth edition, or if you play Savage Worlds, there's nothing wrong with branching out and grabbing a copy of some of these more obscure games. Anyway, it will make yeah. your game better. It really will. The more systems you kind of get a sense of, the more understanding of gameplay you get a sense of. You know, so don't be afraid to pick up a book, even if you never play it. You'll still learn a mass from reading through the rules and systems of a different game. I, I, well, I, I like really the, recommend it. Like one of the newer stuff I picked up was Mutant Year Zero, and that's because it's also mm. the basis of the Alien game and the basis of 2049. And so I was like, I really want to understand how the these okay. original mechanics work and um, what they do, because I love the Alien game, and it's like, I, I really want to understand. So I'm totally, totally with you on on that, you know, understanding how all these different systems work. So what? So that's a lot of stuff. So does anybody have on their hard drive like OSR stuff like like me? I mean, I've got Osric, Basic Fantasy, BX Essentials, Astonishing Swordsmen and Sorcerers of Hyperborea, DCC. You, know, you guys got any of that stuff <laughs> at all? I apart from the original second edition books that I have on my shelf, I've not I've not delved into OSR. Um, so no, I'm I'm very much a modern jiggy with the kids kind of RPG collector <laughs> at the moment. 
Well, I was just curious because some of that stuff's absolutely free. You know, you just download the PDF and away you go. So I, it, was, it, it doesn't take much to get one of these systems. You don't have to pay for them generally. They're all available free. and Well, not DCC, of course, but um, a, a lot of these systems are. What, now, what about... It is um, freaking me out that my D&D folder has got like 11,000 items in it. But apart from that, I've just looked at <laughs> so, so it. Flip- well, let's flip this around. So what about... Um, books that teach you something like obviously i think you know i've got the sly flourish lazy dungeon master yeah. series of books there's um what about that do you guys have any what kind of uh you know those we books know james have, does i mean james has lots of them but yeah yeah and, and look i i think this will probably be the fifth or sixth time i've mentioned this guy keith amans monsters know what they're doing is a well-worn well-used I kind of I will read this book once a week um, just to remind myself about tactics and how to look at games from the antagonist point of view and try and get the most out of my antagonist. So, yeah, that's and Sly Farish for me is is huge. You know, um, Mike Shays does an amazing job with all of his material in terms of trying to work it so that I don't have to spend thousands of hours prepping for a game is very, very important that they're, they're my two. They're. I don't even I don't even think of them as obscure things. On they are very much my user manuals for a week by week. This is how I run things now. Um, keep the mic. So yeah, that, that they'd be my two big ones. Very cool. Yeah, I I, I definitely like the the lazy series. Um, and I, I listen to his podcast now regularly too. Um, so uh, it's it's really good stuff. There's a I had a couple of other ones that I was looking at, and I said, you know what, I've got these books, but I hardly ever read them. You know, I can't even remember reading them um, or, or taking advantage of what's in there. So it's just like the Lazy Dungeon Master stuff is very resonates a lot with me. So um, and and he's got a great I'm when both, he's. Go ahead, sir. I'm I'm both lazy and a dungeon master, so it, it resonates with me as well. <laughs> well, I, I'm not a dungeon master TM, so I mean I'm a game master, so I guess none <laughs> of this applies to me. But anyway. <laughs> But something also for our listeners, you know, if they, if, like we've recommended a couple of guides to how to do this better, but if you've come across a, a little gem, um, I'd love to know. Um, I'm constantly on the lookout for guides, better ways that I can be doing what I do. So um, if, if you've got a little, if you've got a little beautiful book that you know of that, that has helped you along your journey, um, sing out, shoot us an email. Let's, um, I'd love to, I'd love to broaden the, uh, broaden the experience and, and that email is game master at mastering the rpg.com that's that, that's what i said game master at mastering the rpg.com so <laughs> so uh, not dungeon master games master <laughs> I, mean, I guess i could create that one too just in case somebody does decide to do that but uh <laughs> these are just redirects anyway so um now you got me thinking i should take a note so um <laughs> So what? So what other? I would like to do one last little shout out. Can I do one last shout out? You can absolutely do a shout out. out. Go for it. You got something big in your hands. Yeah, this is big. Um, and I know I rave about Call of Cthulhu a lot, but um, another joyous book that I really, really love is their Malleus Monstorum, which is their is the Call of Cthulhu monster manuals, and there's two of them, but there's one of them that is just about the gods of Call of Cthulhu. So one is your monsters, you know, like I hit a zombie and there's stat blocks and all that kind of stuff. But the, the second tome in this, in this box set is based on the gods, the deities of the mythos. And it is extraordinary. If It doesn't have stats because they're, they're all going to kill you anyway, right? So, right. But it does talk about entities of eldritch evil that you could drop into just about any campaign that you like. But the reason why I love this book, and if, you, if you've got a chance to, to have a look at it, um, I thoroughly recommend this. There's a guy called Loic Muzi, and he's, he's a Polish guy, and his artwork is in this. And if you've ever tried to capture abhorrent, unnameable horrors in art form, uh, Loic does it so well. Um, it is probably the be- most beautiful, horrible terrifying book that i've ever had witnessed so um uh, have a look at it check it out the malleus monstorum uh, by chaosium 
probably the, the scariest looking monster manual you will ever, ever likely to see. <laughs> yeah, so. The art looks really amazing. It is sick stuff. So yeah, yeah, enjoy. <laughs> enjoy the nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> well, very cool. Very cool. Um, so, so we're just hanging out. Any other things you guys want to throw out there? It doesn't have to be bookshelf or anything like that. That we're just hanging out. We got a couple more minutes, or we can. Uh, I, mean, we can my, call I would it a day. say for me, like my a bigger collection of books for me is um, I have a lot of a lot. Like I have a lot of an, an old books and random books from different countries of like myths and fairy tales. Yeah. Um, yeah like absolutely. I have a lot of them. I have like uh, basically a big, big like a uh, bookshelf, like a two two shelf bookshelf that's just all of that um and those are really fun to like you know and, and there's the the classic kind of european ones like of course the grim fairy tales but i but that I, like like i have the whole um colored fairy book i don't know if you know like the pink and the blue one which are which is like i have the full collection of that which are like really really cool and there's some really obscure stuff in there and the, the wonder clock which was howard Pyle, which was the, his take on them and then I have all these like weird like like basically from all over like Norwegian and Japanese and Indonesian and Native American like and those are just so fun to and I haven't done it that much but like if you ever kind of need inspiration for especially fantasy um, just kind of crack those open and be like oh I could kind of a, a lot of those little like because they're not that long you could kind of insert and like make a little like uh, side quest you know involving mm. like. That, that fairy tale so those are just really fun to kind of go into and get inspiration and or like weird monsters right like there's just there's still it's such a rich tapestry and james like you, you even said at the front like how australian mythology um uh, both both like uh the um the the uh, i don't know what's what's the term for your Ab first people first, fine. Aboriginal, aboriginal like first, first people yeah first peoples um and also just like you know there's the first peoples there's also um australian myth right just how we yeah. have it too we have like native american first people myth and we also have our own kind of myth which I, I actually have a book of that too with like you know what's his name who rides on a, like a leopard and has like a snake whip right um uh, but I feel like there's so much of that stuff from the world that's just so underutilized and undertapped, right? Like, I mean, th that'd be, that would be cool to kind of use a lot of Australian stuff and to kind of in uh, put that into for American audiences because it's just, we, and I think we've talked about this before. So, yeah, that's something that I'm proud of is that large collection of um, mythology because I, you know, I, said, I think I've talked about it before is I wanted to do storytelling and I apprenticed with a storyteller. So I started collecting um, uh, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> and, so that, for me, that's my great. big collection of things. Yeah, it's fun to have. Yeah, and you said I, you I've had got, nothing. I've got going. large tomes of uh, one of my most beloved books is I've got a, a 1920 anthology of archaeological digs around the world. Oh, nice. And a, it's set in this particular set in time. But um, you know, the amount of times I've just quickly wanted to grab a tomb from somewhere. And it'll be from some obscure place in South America or some obscure place in the Middle East and always great. So, yeah, using those first um, source kind of historical materials, too, as well as the, 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 um, the myths and legends, for sure. My, my, my shelves are full of them. They're great. And that's something that, like, I think uh, any bookstore you go to, um, you know, maybe not a new one, but ones that have, like, used books, like, go to their international, their, their mythology section, and you'll find, like, super weird random books um, from like all around the world, like just the most random stuff that just has really kind of inspirational things for our games. So, um, yeah. And here you Holy said you didn't have cool stuff on your bookshelf. So there you well, go. Well, <laughs> but you know, g game related stuff. I just don't have that many. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, the other thing I like, I have a large tarot collection, but that isn't really, I mean, I just like it. Yeah. I have some, I have some weird tarot decks yeah my, 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 my favorite one is the original printing of the james bond tarot deck that they came out with for <laughs> oh, i think it's you kidding it's right here oh yeah it's right here let me let me show you um <laughs> i have a lot of them and, there, and there's a lot of weird ones but this one was like this one they actually printed out when um uh, i don't know if you guys can there we go. for for those listening at home because this is a podcast eric's now <laughs> holding up in front of our discord channel the james bond 007 tarot card deck and it looks weird <laughs> It's super weird. This one was printed in the, I think in the 70s. It was for, um, I forget what, the movie that they used it where like Death came up. I can't remember which movie. I think, yeah, I can't remember which one it was, but um, it was like a limited run that they did based on that movie. And it's just, just so, cool. I don't know. So yeah, do tarot cards like cool work if they're, you know, who's like the, what is it like? There's um, the, the something of swords. This, uh, I mean, how do they figure out yeah. who's going to be each one Cups of these? And swords and yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's that's the cool thing about tarot, like where it's it's very um, 
there's the kind of archetype, and it's its own story, right? There's the archetype of it, um, which is kind of you know the hero's journey, basically. Um, uh, but then everybody, every artist, can you can do your own spin on what they like, what the symbology is, or what kind of the thing is, as long as you hit like a couple of points. So that's why I like it. Why every tarot deck can be so different, right? Based on yeah. the um, yeah. uh, take, yeah. Very cool. And now Very I've cool. just Googled the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles tarot deck, and there is right? one, and I'll there be is ordering one. it. Yeah, see, I, that's the fun thing too. Is there, there's often a tarot deck for the most random stuff. Uh, that makes me want to order it too. I want the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles tarot deck. <laughs> Um, yeah, okay. I, and now I'm going to start, I'll have to Google uh, like different topics and see Dragon what the, the deck's deck. like. <laughs> yeah. There probably is one. Um, so yeah. at least there's a dragon one. I'm sure there's one that's got dragons all over it for sure. There's so. many oh, yeah. dragon Danny ones, Danny. Carl. Let me, let me, let me tell you, there's many dragon ones. So, okay. So beautiful. That's beautiful. Um, now we, now we just have to come up with a system that you can use those cards you draw the cards and that randomly determines like an adventure or something i actually think there's a game called well, decima that does exactly that well fa fa faith faith faith, the, faith uh, the, the, the faith that i talked about before like that is completely based on there's no dice you use playing card decks as your dice for both the game masters and for players um so and that's you know but playing cards but it's pretty much the same thing right tarot, tarot was based on playing cards originally um so yeah Cool. There's a probably. I think there is a game that's based on Tarot. I can't remember it's, what it's called though. Um, but yeah. Anyways. Very cool. All right. Well, I I think we casual comboed our way through this <laughs> this one. So yeah. hope, you know. So hey, uh, normally I do the spiel about hopefully you got something out of it, but I just hope that you were entertained. Um, so thanks everyone who joined us, and hopefully you got entertained by hearing what's on our shelf. Remember, you can drop by MasteringTheRPG.com to learn about us and all the projects and every good stuff. Um, email Game Master at MasteringTheRPG if you got a question, um, want to give some feedback, want to give us the books that you like with respect to, you know, game, game mastering tips or you've got an obscure something or other that you want to share. Hey, I'm, I'm all, all ears um, or all eyes reading it in an email, I guess. Um, so if you like the show, hey, please help us with a positive review um, in the podcatcher of your choice. Uh, we like doing the show. It's fun. Um, this particular topic was fun to do. Um, so once again, thanks, everybody, for joining us. And uh, once again, this is Carl with Eric and James. Say goodbye, guys. Goodbye, guys. Happy gaming. <laughs>